Thank you for joining another edition of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm your host, Brian Ferguson. My guest today is a legend in the pro wrestling magazine world. He started as a writer in 1970, working for Mr. Stanley Weston, who he considers his mentor as a photographer, writer, and reporter. He eventually became the senior editor of Mr. Weston's wrestling publications. He is best known for writing, photographing, and publishing for Pro Wrestling Illustrated. He has interacted with many of the greatest wrestlers, managers, promoters, and announcers of all time. He currently works with OneWrestlingVideo.com, as well as writes a monthly column in a new wrestling magazine called Inside the Ropes, which was released on September 17th. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome the legendary Mr. Bill Apter. Bill, thank you for taking the time out of your thank busy you. schedule to join well, us thank today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm, uh, uh, I always love to be on shows of people that are passionate about the business, and you exude passion. Well, I really appreciate that. You thank you. I've, follow, I've read your magazines, your books since I was a kid. Your book, Is Wrestling Broke? I Didn't Know It Was Fixed. No, uh, no, you, it's the other way around. You, you, oh, yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> no, it's okay. it's okay. It's all right. It's it's uh, you wrote it backwards. It's, <laughs> read it backwards. Is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. Right. Exactly. Today is what, hey, Mr. Raptor? Today, while we're taping this show on October 1st, is the fifth Earth Day of my baby book. Yeah, oh, that's great. And I've read it, and I highly recommend it. It's great. It's what I like about it. You read a few pages, you get some pictures. You read a few more pages, you get pictures. That's the best kind of reading for a guy. You know what? You know what Jim Cornette said about my book? What did he say? He said, Bill After's book sucks. He doesn't bury anybody. Well, you're right in there. You don't have any enemies that you know of. No. I, I, uh, when, when I undertook this uh, book project, which ECW Press uh, approached me with a long time ago, um, I said, you know, I'm going to write the way I always wrote, and I don't write anything bad about anybody. Because the worst thing, people that are internet reporters, they say, oh, you know, so-and-so won't let me into their show, and it's a little indie show. I said, well, what did you write about them? Well, I said, you know, their shows suck, but they can get better. I said, if you, if you tick somebody off, you've already made yourself an enemy. So yes. just be careful, you know, when you, you can knock something creatively very easily, it's the way you say it. So, yeah. it, and I, I rarely use four letter words here, but I'm going to use one. Don't piss anybody off and then you can stay <laughs> in the business. Yeah. That's right. And in your book, you talk about that. Uh, some of your, uh, what, in the early seventies, when you were going to shows, uh, sometimes uh, Vince McMahon Sr., are those guys I read about, if they didn't, if they saw something in your, the magazine that you weren't, you didn't own, but you were part of it, they looked yeah. at you and said, hey. I was the face. Yes. Yeah. And what was that kind of like? I mean, you kind of explain it in your book some, but oh, give a little that more was detail. Scary. That was very scary because uh, I was on the road a lot and mm -hmm. did most of the photography. And there are a lot of stories I didn't write. Mm -hmm. And I never really got to see. Mm -hmm. And then a promoter would come over to me and he says, what is this crap? What did you? I said, oh, I didn't write that. I, you, you, and they would really get mad. And some promoters actually try to ban me from coming into their shows. The worst one, <coughs> the worst one was when Mr. Weston got this exceptional set of photos from Theo Eret, our California photographer. And he opened it up and he called me into the office and he laid them out on the table. And it was two gorgeous, sexy bikini ladies in an apartment making like they were wrestling. He says, we're going to create a thing called apartment wrestling. <laughs> I said, for what magazine? Sports Review. So I said, the, the guys in the business and the promoters, I don't care. I'm a publisher. I'm in this to make money, not to please them. So as soon as the apartment wrestling stuff started coming out, people like Chief J. Strongbow came over to me and said, don't put me in this magazine with this porn that back then that was considered pornography probably. Yeah. But yet that magazine sold 
better than almost any other magazine because kids would buy the book, the magazine, and the parents, what do you, it's a wrestling magazine. Oh, they're just having to put this in it. Okay, well, don't look at those pages. But yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of heat over that. And there are a lot of people, uh, promoters and wrestlers who were angry, I mean, furious over the rankings. Hey, Bill. You made me number three, and you said that this guy is better than me making him number two? I said, well, this was three months ago. It doesn't matter. How could you make him even number two ever? And they were really, and then eventually when the PWI 500 came around, I didn't write that, and that wasn't even my idea. But, but the first hundred guys, we sat in a conference room, all the editors, all the editors, and we, we ranked the top 100 guys there. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I have to tell you that when I went out in the field, if a guy was number 101 or 102, he was furious. Or, oh, it was horrible. Number one and number 500. Well, everybody was very grateful. <laughs> so. Let's talk about when... Uh... Mr. Weston told you about when Bruno San Martino was going to lose the title. What was that like for you? You there or did I lose you? I got you. You're there. We froze yeah. for a second. I, I see. Yeah. I asked you uh, the night when Mr. Weston told you that Bruno was going to lose the title and you had to keep it quiet. Well, he didn't really say those words. He didn't really say, he said, are you going to the garden tonight? I said, yeah. Well, I just got a call from Willie Gilsenberg. The main event, Bruno and Koloff. Make sure you have a lot of film. <laughs> that was the hint, right? So, yeah. So that, that, was, uh, that was the tip off to me. Yeah, but because Mr. Weston um, had the confidence of the guys back then, yeah. uh, he didn't want to you know, break that to the young rookie guy here. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I didn't, you know, it's funny because I never asked uh, who's going to lose the tap. The wrestlers especially once I started with the, um, on the days of the, the heyday of the Crockett promotions, that's when guys would start tipping me off. And that was a long time after I started. Actually, at the very beginning, the original um, kangaroos, uh, Al Costello and Roy Heffernan, but at this time it was uh, Don Ken. Al Costello, a couple of times, he used to call me Stanley's boy, <laughs> even though I wasn't related to Stanley. Right. Uh, he'd say, oh, Stanley's boy, just make sure you have a lot of film for, for number three, match number three. Right? Right. There might be a title ch change because Don Kent and I have been uh, working out quite a bit and uh, I think we're going to win the belts tonight. <laughs> so he told me, but he didn't tell didn't me. Didn't tell you. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, you also talk about in your book your relationship with uh, Buddy Rogers. Oh. And it, it, it's... It's very interesting uh, what you describe in there. Um, can you give us a little insight about, you know, how you yeah, saw him I, one when way? I was growing up, when I was growing up, um, for some reason, Buddy Rogers captured my fancy. The way he'd talk on interviews and say, listen, this Edward Carpentier guy might have a good body, but he doesn't have it up here. And he'd hit point to his temple yeah. there. And then his loudmouth manager, Bobby Davis, who is still alive. I talked to him a few weeks ago. Oh, wow. He was in Texas. He'd go, Mr. Morgan, Buddy Rogers. So I was just, I used to strut outside the apartment building that I lived in. And there was a gang across the street outside the, the Hilltop candy store luncheonette. And I'd strut and one of them would say, hey, there's effing nature boy. And they'd stomp and kill me. No, they didn't hold anything back every night. And I come home beaten up. My parents said, well, don't do that again. The next night I'm right out there again. And after they beat me up, I stood up and I strutted away pointing to my temple. Um, so I never really got to meet Buddy back in the old days. I met him once in front of Sunnyside Garden because one of my friends, Thomas, somebody said he's Buddy Rogers' nephew. So I, Rogers coming out of a cab and I said, hey, is Tommy? You no, I never heard of him. That was it. <laughs> so then I finally got to meet him in 1979 um, in the Crockett Territory. And we became really good friends when he became a, uh, a host and a greeter at the Playboy 
club in Atlantic City after he fully retired. We, mm -hmm. I used to go and hang out with him, and he he was he looked like a he looked like I don't know he looked like a pimp. <laughs> he, he had, he had, he'd have on a cowboy hat and a cigar and a white suit, but and everybody mm. that came into that hotel, hey Pally, how you doing? <laughs> um, but he wasn't anything like that. But he had two personalities, which is what I wrote about in my book, yeah. where he made his life out of the pro wrestling business. And it's not like today when you go over to someone, let's say like The Miz or somebody like that, and ask him, you know, is what you do legit or whatever? And they'll say, well, you know, we're, it's entertainment. Back in that day, if you said it was entertainment, Buddy would, his whole personality would just completely, completely change. And he'd want to fight you yeah. and show you that it was real. Yeah, wow. there is a whole chapter on yeah. the two Buddy Rogers, the yeah. nice guy who everybody loved. And then the Buddy Rogers, where if you were not on his good side, and you said something about wrestling being fixed. I didn't know it was broken, of course. Um, yes. He, uh, yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't like that too much. Yeah, I, I read it. It's like I said, it's a great book. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you. Now you're in, you're in Kansas City. I am, sir. Yes. And that's where uh, um, Ric Flair won the, uh, the title. Yes, sir, he did. And my Kansas City story back there, of course, is I might take a train. <laughs> I might take a plan, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but my story there is uh, Bob Geigel promoted the show where uh, Flair won the NWA World Heavyweight Championship for the first time. And he wow. wanted me to pose Rick. And Rick did not want to pose with the belt because he just he felt he just didn't look good in there. And it uh, took a half hour of Bob Geigel and they all oh, plan. If we don't like the pictures, we won't use them. So he said, well, get it in the ring the next time. But I did get the pictures. Yeah, but I always enjoyed coming to Kansas City because back in the old days, that was like part of the St. Louis territory. That was that was wrestling God kingdom. The Mecca. Yes, Dan Muchnick, uh, Bob Geigel, Pat O'Connor. I mean, oh, man. First time I met Pat O'Connor, I was like a kid in a candy store because here's a guy that's had this – huge match with uh, uh, Buddy Rogers at Comiskey Park. And it was the first largest crowd in wrestling history. So, and here he says, oh, you're Stanley's boy. You're a friend of mine. And that was it. We, we, yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah. That's wonderful. <clears throat> so the Cal Championship. Oh, but yes. Let's, let's talk about that. How did that come about? Is it still in, is it still in use? Well, only because you can see me on video. I have a statue of Bruno San Martino here given to me by Bud Carson from uh, um, Pro Wrestling Wrestling World. Mm -hmm. And there's the I, I see it. gold belt that uh, um, Reggie Parks made for me. The original belt, the original belt is behind me also. It's a it's a uh, cardboard belt. It's, ooh, I'm trying to, few fans that can't see this, I'm sorry, it's right there. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a belt above that made out of 450 Legos that one of my fans made. For Bill me. Apter, I see it. Yes, WWE, yes. Yeah. So um, uh, the cow belt. So when wrestlers started to come to the office to get their picture taken in our set up studio, I'd start messing around with them and wrestling with them in the studio. So uh, Jimmy Valiant started to call me Wonderful Willie <laughs> when he came to the office. And he did a, I had a video camera and we taped him doing a promo on me. Willie, you've been a thorn in my side for 20 years and the whole thing. So we had a little match in the office and we videotaped it. And we named, originally it was the National Office Belt. And then I said, wait a minute, why don't we call it Championship Office Wrestling? Call it Cow Championship Office Wrestling. So through the years, guys heard about this through the, grapevine of guys that would come up to the office. Rob Van Dam did a moonsault off a Xerox machine onto me. Now oh, I have wow. videotape. I have videotape of all this stuff that when I can go back and do my uh, one man shows, there's a, uh, an 11 minute highlight tape of uh, me against uh, RVD, New Jack, Diamond Dallas Page. Um, <clears throat> so many guys, Ray Mysterio, uh, all 
going for the Cal Championship. Uh, the last person I, I defended it in my house here against Johnny Storm from uh, from England. We said we said okay, the house is an official uh, an official office. So uh, yeah, I still one, once in a while an indie guy will come down to Actors Alley and uh, want a shot at the at the title, but That's nobody's sense. been able to uh, to get it yet. Nobody's the champ. I will I will show you. It, and unfortunately, I can't share my screen with you because we're on audio. Yeah, sorry. So, but one day, <laughs> one day, somehow, uh, I may release that to the public. But the problem is, the a lot of the other people that were in the office at that time may not want to be seen on these videos. Yeah. So I might have to have a special group Zoom show where I'm showing my personal videos. That's a great idea. I just thought of that. There he goes. Glad we could we could help. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I don't know what to charge though. That would probably be a hundred dollars a ticket there. Whoa. <laughs> It'd be 99, worth it. 99 for you. Yeah, thank you, sir. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> One uh, quick question here. I, in the 80s, you talk about in your book how uh, the WWF uh, kind of shut out the magazines from coming into the arenas. When I read about that, I was curious on how you still were able to get information on those events, the rankings and things like that. I mean, because I still saw WWF in the magazines, you yes, know, pro wrestling, yeah. inside wrestling, all that. That, that, that that's, in, that's complex but easy to answer. When we were banned, um, I didn't go. I Once in a while, I'd go to the matches. Uh, I had friends in the WWF office, and they knew that I wasn't bringing a camera, so I'd go and Sit there. You, and there were people that called in results to the wrestling magazine office the next day. Fans okay. would do that all the time. Okay. Um, we bought photos from uh, UPI and other photo services or from people that were in the stands. We were not a magazine that was selling posters or anything. So we, were, we considered ourselves news, which is why I think WWF never came after us because we were reporting what was going on. Yeah. And in terms of stories, we were following the storylines and we would sit around every Friday around the editor's desk, Peter King and then Stu, uh, Stu Sachs, and we'd come up with ideas to uh, make the story even better than they what they were doing. And although the promoters didn't, the WWF promoters looked down upon this, they never called us out on anything. And if I see a wrestler at one of the airports or something, they'd oh man, that was a freaking great story you guys ran yeah. on me. How can I get on the cover? I said, well, you got to talk to Vince and he's not going to let you. They had their own wrestling magazine, which right. is why they had taken us out. There was never any hard feelings. Um, today, my relationship with them is fabulous. As you know, I'm on the WWE Network yeah. uh, on a lot of their shows. Yeah. So yeah, it was very hard uh, to sit out WrestleManias and watch them on pay-per-view down here in Actors Alley when I should have been there. Yes. Yeah. You should have got uh, a VIP. Yeah, but uh, that that didn't happen. That and a lot of the wrestlers, a lot of the wrestlers were, were very upset because they wanted to. Now, when I jumped over to Wow Magazine, yeah, that was even worse because the WWE saw that magazine and was like, <gasps> what that magazine looked like. It looked better than their magazine in terms of the quality. And okay. guy, oh, their guys there on their roster were calling me. I don't care. Meet me in a hotel. Take my picture. You know, Vince isn't going to fire me. And I did that a couple of times. And yeah. the guys never got fired. They got some heat from it, but they never got fired. And one time in WoW Magazine, um, Shawn Michaels had called me. Um, he had just retired, I think, for the first time. Uh, but he was still doing stuff for WWF. And he wanted to, how do I get in WoW Magazine? And me being someone who likes to do things right, I said, call Vince McMahon. If he says it's okay, I will fly down, come to your house and do a whole story. And surprisingly, Vince okayed it. Yeah, I think he has a lot of respect for you. I know well, he does. I appreciate that. Yeah, like a lot of people. Um, if anybody's ever read a wrestling magazine from... 1970 to you know 2004 you're you're in one of them either as an article 
Uh, and I read too, you don't have any really formal training as a, as a writer, which surprised me. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you about that. Uh, but before we get that, the most important thing in the wrestling business, especially back then, was relationships. Mm -hmm. It didn't really matter what I wrote or what I photographed. What mattered was my Rolodex and that the guys in the business took me in as one of them. Yeah. The wrestling business back then was like the mafia. You don't get in unless you know somebody, you know? <laughs> That's what it was like, yeah. yeah. And I was able to, and George Napolitano was able to um, break through the ranks and become part of, part of the, uh, the business. Um, what was your question now? I'm sorry, I, I needed to... Uh... No, that's okay. I was just asking you about uh, when uh, you're writing, you, you write oh, yeah. your book, you didn't have any uh, formal training, you did some no. college, but it was in uh, broadcasting, I believe. Yeah, well, uh, the whole deal with me here is when I started with Mr. West and he put me in front of a typewriter and started me writing stories. And after about a week, he said to me, this is, t you know, this is horrible. <laughs> And he tear it up in front of me, tear the papers up in front of me. I don't hear your voice. I listen to you on the radio. You come here and you tell me stories about what happened at the matches, but I don't hear that. He says, you're trying to be a writer. You're trying to use hundred dollar words and that's not how you speak. I want to hear your voice. And that's when I started writing my gossip columns because um, that's what I liked to read when I was growing up in the New York Post was these Hollywood TV gossip columns. And that's what I liked to write. I didn't like to write stories. I wasn't a feature writer. I was more of a column guy. So after, so with the book, um, when I finally was, my, had both my arms broken by Greg Oliver, who edited the book to do this book finally, after like they, an offer from 12 years before that, um, he said to me, he said, write the way you write and I'll polish it. And that's what he did because I'm a comma maniac. I put in 5,000 commas in a sentence. Yeah. Uh, so no, what I do now, the way I write, and I don't write a lot anymore. I, I love going on you know, the U One Wrestling Video YouTube channel mm -hmm. and doing my editorials that way. Um, but if I write anything, like the column in Inside the Ropes magazine, I write it so you can hear my voice. And before people knew there was an audio version of my book, it was wrestling fixed, I didn't know it was broken. They were reading it and they said, we can hear, we hear yep. Uncle, Un Uncle Willie talking. Yeah, so you can. Great, and you know, you can and, hear you talking, that's great. And I just want to reiterate, today is the fifth anniversary, October 1st, 2020. So, and at the end of the program, we'll, I'll, we'll make sure that when we uh, publish this, I'll put your link for Amazon and everything for your book. Oh, you, also wrote a, you also wrote a book before, uh, I found out, uh, Rampage? No, I know, no. See, that's not you? I know, I, I absolutely hate what Amazon does. They have hundreds of magazines all saying by Bill After, which is not true. Okay. Rampage was published by a publishing company that I think was associated with WOW magazine. Okay. And they bought the rights to it. I had nothing to do with it. Okay. The, is Wrestling Fixed is the first book I have ever written. And when I see Rampage by Bill After, yep. I tried to get Amazon to, no, it's not by me. They won't answer me. All these hundreds and hundreds of Bill After magazines there by Bill After, they're put on Amazon by independent companies, independent uh. collectors. Yeah, so all these there we people go. making some money go for my name that I can use for my mortgage. Exactly. Well, now we know the truth. So Rampage is not by Mr. Bill Apter. Don't no, know. no, no. But I believe it's a collection of stories from WOW Magazine. Okay. And, and I just went on a Rampage. That's okay. Uh, we'll ask just a couple more questions. Uh, <laughs> one is, you talk about leaving PWI to go to, to WOW. Yeah. What, I mean, you read about it, but I, I know it had to be really a difficult oh. decision. And just kind of, if you would, please just talk about that just for a moment. How feeling, uh, I wasn't like going to go. I wasn't going to go. Okay. They had, uh, they had gotten in touch with me through Paul Heyman. They had, because we were doing the ECW 
No, they were doing the uh, ECW magazine. Okay. And Paul Heyman was highly involved with them. Yep. And he called me one day. He said, did you see this new effing magazine? I said, <laughs> so I went to look at it on the newsstands and I was blown away by what it looked like. He says, they want to talk to you. Okay. So I, I called them. I said, when can you come down here? We want to hire you. I said, well, I don't even know who you people are. <laughs> oh, well, this is it. And we're going to fly in next Tuesday. So I said, well, I need a, a letter of intent or something, whatever. Well, we'll get you the airline tickets. We'll talk. And I said, no, no, I need to know what you want to do. And uh, they sent me a letter overnight offering me a lot of money to come on to be the editor of their magazine. I was telling them, I said, I'm not really an editor guy. I'm not a, a, a wordsmith to crossing out the the right wrong words and putting in the right. I said, that's not what I do. It's no, but everybody knows you. Everybody in the industry knows you. You'd be the figurehead for what we're doing. I said, listen, I'll come and I'll listen, but I work for Stanley Weston and I'm loyal to Stanley Weston. So at that point, the magazines were just being sold to the new publisher in Pennsylvania. So I went, I'm trying to think, no, we had already moved to Pennsylvania. Yeah, we already moved to Pennsylvania. So it was no longer Stanley Weston territory. So I went and they offered me more money than I had ever made. You know, at the PWI company, I was on a weekly salary, mm -hmm. medical benefits, dental benefits, uh, took care of my kids. That was, it was a regular job. That's why all the photos that I shot while I was there, they own all that stuff. Okay. So I worked for the company. Right. Uh, people say, oh, do you regret that? Said, no, great job. Um, so I turned well down <clears throat> and the editor, the publisher again called me and he said, well, what the hell's the matter with you? We'll give you a three year contract at this amount. I said, well, we'll give you a $25,000 signing bonus. So now I go home, my wife says, we really can use this money. So the next thing I did two days later, there was a WrestleMania here in Philadelphia or a SummerSlam. And I went to, to see uh, Linda McMahon at the Fan Fest. And she said to me, if you go with those people, we love you. We're never going to be able to work with you at all because those people are offering our wrestlers money to pose for their covers. Sable. Remember those covers? Uh, yes, I do. Yes. Right. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> so I talked over with relatives and they had no clue what I'm talking about. Then McMahon can't tell you what to do. They're not telling me what to do. You don't get this. You're not in the wrestling business. So then they offered me another $15,000. So now in Pennsylvania, I'm, uh, I'm not with Mr. Weston anymore. And Craig Peters had just left to join Ringling Brothers as a PR agent. And he said to me, you know, there's no better time in your life to make a move than right now. And he said, look at this magazine, it's total kick ass. So I made the decision. I went in to see Stu Sachs and he said, I know already. I said, how do you know? Just the look on your face. And uh, I went to talk to the publisher in Pennsylvania. He didn't want to see me. Um, it was hard to leave. Yeah. It's hard to leave. The day that I started, I worked out of my house and the day I started, I had to go to Chicago area where the magazine, where Wild Magazine was. The first hour of the first day of the first meeting, one of the secretaries came in and says, there's a phone call for you. I pick up the phone, it's Stu Sachs, are you okay? Wow. Uh, I said, I think so. Wow, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that that's that's what happened. And it lasted, I had a three-year contract, but the magazine never made three years. They had other magazines that um, lost money because of lawsuits of things they were doing with teen magazines and stuff. Yeah. And eventually, WOW magazine started putting in penis enlargement ads and stuff like this. Because oh. the people were, well, the people were, the, the uh, ad companies were making a fortune on this, but I, so by the time it was almost over, um, the publisher came, you know, we're looking to sell the magazines. Uh, I said, well, I don't even like 
what this is anymore because of these ads and everything. Yeah. And uh, I tried to get someone to a few people to buy the magazines, but they wouldn't, they didn't want to do it. And uh, that was it. They went out of business and it was about a year and a half, I think, or a little less than I was there. And it wasn't a secured contract. I found out oh, from my no. lawyer brother-in-law. So they owed me nothing. Uh. So for the first time in my career, I was without a magazine. And then a few days later, a call came from England. Oh, hi, Bill. We own the rights to the British WOW. Ah, back in business. <laughs> so. That's great. Well, I'm, I'm glad it worked out for you. I mean, in the book, you talk about it. and Yeah, it was very, very difficult. Yeah. Good reminiscing, but very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. One more question. Your induction into the... Uh, Professional Wrestling Hall of Fame up in uh, uh, Iowa. Iowa. Yeah. So, again, you, you can't, the fans here can't see this, but if you see behind me over here, I have a ladder. Yes, I see it. All my awards on it. Stacked. My awards on it. It's my, lad, my ladder of success. Best use of a ladder ever. Yeah. That was incredible on some of you because it, it was – it was such a, a, a moment that made me feel that what I've done meant so much. And every Hall of Fame that I go into, mm -hmm. 16 of them, all make me feel that way. But the one sweet thing that night was the cow championship had been <laughs> stolen by Dan Severn uh -oh. several years before Iowa. Well, he was inducted into the same... Uh, class as I was yeah or he was there that night and before he accepted he had a briefcase with him and he gets up there to talk to everybody he says the man who just accepted his award is a cardboard champion and he opens up his briefcase and there's the belt the cardboard <laughs> belt that you see behind him he never he used to put it on his gimmick table along with his UFC and NWA titles wow yeah so that was bittersweet really yeah. was really and animal was uh inducted the same year as uh same year as me yeah i i you know i what's i'll just say something quick about him he, great guy actually i was gonna do a podcast with him we were actually getting ready to schedule it i talked to him the friday before he passed on oh, wow. through facebook messenger uh we were getting ready to uh finalize some things he gave me a thumbs up and then i read uh the following week that he had passed and at Tantera, which is only about a couple hours from here. He, um, his wife, Kim sent me a Facebook message that for his 60th birthday, she's contacting a bunch of his friends to cut a video. Would I mind doing that? No, oh. I did it. Yeah. I did it. So what I did was, um, I made like I was grab on video grabbing some papers from like a producer and saying, oh, who's this shout out for Joe? Or the wrestler with face paint? You mean demolition, right? So, <laughs> right, exactly. All right. So the next day, next day, she said he was rolling on the flare floor laughing. I thought he was going to die. And a oh. week later, a week yeah. later, oh. wow. Away. Yeah. It's it's and then you know recently at right before him was Kamala. Uh, oh yeah, he was a good friend of mine. I used to like to, yeah. he, you know, he loved to sing and I loved to sing too. Yeah. So we had a lot in common that way. No, Kamala was great. What a what a great character. Yeah, it was. Really, one of the all-time great characters because yeah. people believed. And on OneWrestlingVideo.com, I I ran an interview with him back from Wrestle Reunion. Okay. Just mom groaning and moaning at me. It was, <laughs> it was great. It was great. Oh, well, uh, one more thing. What are you doing now? I know you talk about it in your book, but... I'm sitting here talking to you. Well, besides that... <laughs> All right. Well, <clears throat> of course, one wrestling video, that's the number one. Every few days I update with another video mm -hmm. or an after chat. Yep. Um, I'll be doing an auction on Facebook with Gimmick Tree Entertainment on the 11th of October. All right. Uh, it's called Bill Apter's Birthday Bash. It'll be at 12 o'clock because my birthday's on the 22nd. So uh, we're going to do that. And I'm, I'm going to put up for auction some items from Apter's Alley. Ah, yeah. not a lot, right. just some of them, just some, some of them. Some of the little nuggets. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm also maintaining my uh, 
uh, day job for a company called Ahead, A-H-E-D-D dot org, where um, the mission is to uh, find competitive employment and job coaching for persons with disabilities. So, yeah, That's I do great. that too. And I'm also going to be doing, uh, I'm not sure where it's going to be yet, but I'm also going to be doing uh, like celebrity shout out type of thing. People have asked me, how can, how can I get a shout out? And I don't know if I want to deal with any of these individual companies. So yeah. I think the first wave of this, I'm just going to do it on my own. Tape them down here at After's Alley. And not just shout outs, but if you want a, uh, a Barry Manilow, Can't Smile Without You song from me, I've got it all in the other room here. All right. Well, hey, I might take you up on that. And you can follow me on Twitter at After One Wrestling. And okay. um, uh, I'm on Facebook, mm-hmm. or you can email me at beaptor at onewrestling.com. And there's no N in my name. It's not Apner. Dusty Rhodes used to call, he used to say, my buddy Willie Apner, if you will. <laughs> so many people thought I was Willie Apner. There's no N in that. So did I catch that you're a, a Manilow fan too, a fan of them? I don't mind Barry Manilow. I haven't heard him in a while, but yeah. I, yeah well, what I was your favorite Manilow song? Coca Cabana. Oh, of course, yeah. But see, I'm a ballad guy. I love the old uh, ballads, and he every ballad he did was these gut wrenching love songs, and I love that kind of music. Yeah, he was good. good. He's good. He's so, good. all right, sir. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be well, on. Before we leave, program. Right? yes, I have sir. A question to ask you. Yes, sir. Um, this is this, a, a lot of people get nervous when I ask this question, but. <laughs> Is um is wrestling fixed? I didn't know it was broken. I'll see you at the matches eventually. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, my friend.